Greetings. Um, this, is an, this is a review of Peter Sloterdijk's infamous essay, Rules for the Human Zoo. Um, this essay just has to give you a bit of background to it before I kind of go into it more in more detail. Is a essay Sloterdijk wrote about biogenetics and biogenetics, uh, for, for those who are less familiar, refers to the ability to interfere and manipulate the um, human genome. So you, the popular example we normally hear of in this is like designer babies. You know, if, if your woman is pregnant, the parents can sort of take out this gene, put in that gene. And this could be, this could be a medical treatment, a kind of preemptive medical treatment, or it could be just for looks or just for aesthetic purposes. Um, if you haven't seen Attica, it's a good, I think it's Gattaca, not Attica. Gattaca is a good film about um, biogenetics. Um, so, uh, so he's discussing this, but he, the, the, the background to this discussion is um, very much um, in the sense of the civilizing principle, which societies kind of in constantly engage in, of creating kind of um, acceptable. Um, civilized human beings as opposed to animals, right? There's a kind of there's a there's a kind of uh, civilizing and humanizing people out of their more bestial natures, which um, we civilizations of all sorts are just inevitably bound up in. So um, he's going to basically talk about the background to this, the background of humanism. And that's what humanism is for him. Well, it's a few things, but one of them is this is this task of civilizing. Um, and um, then the intrusion of biogenetics into that process. And we're going to refer to a few different philosophers, uh, Nietzsche, Heidegger, and Plato, um, <clears throat> to think about this, basically. So I'm just going to go into the... the essay in more detail and I'm going to be quoting from you, you probably can't see it on the screen you're looking at but I'm going to be quoting and reading from the essay um so he begins the essay by saying this humanism is basically a um culture of of literacy um so making friends is making friends through letters humanizing is um a part of a initia uh, initiation, we could say, process, which universally literate societies um, brought forth. So, um, writing books of all of whatever kind is basically writing to friends of which that you don't yet know who are going to read it or not. So they could be. So, for example, I read Nietzsche, I read Plato, or whatever. Um. I will never meet these people. They've been dead for a long time. But I'm sort of initiated into a canon by the fact that I'm able to read them. Um, I write, I put stuff on my Substack, for example. I'm random people who I've never met or spoken to read them. And through that, there's a sort of initiatory uh, process, which is very much related to the task of creating a kind of civilized and cohesive uh, bond between people um so for example he talks about um grammar in middle english having an etymological similarity to glamour and i've heard this as well with spell like to put a spell on somebody and spelling so media uh reading writing has this component of it's not just informational it's not just about conveying information socially um there's a sense of there's a sort of transformative and a kind of initiatory um background to it um which is bound up as i said in the in the task of civilizing people and to save them from bestiality which is the task of humanism right um, so he quote, he says, what are modern nations except the effective fictions of literate 
Publix, who have become a like-minded collective of friends through reading the same books. Universal obligatory military service for young men and the universal obligation to read the classics for young people of both genders was characteristics a characteristic of the classical bourgeois state. Recalling a period of armed and, and literate humanity of which the old and uh, sorry the new and old conservatives of today look back simultaneously helpless and nostalgic and completely unable to provide a media theory justification for the importance of a literary canon. End quote. So, um, the bourgeois state as we've known it as it has developed as uh, he's pointing out the the um importance of universal literacy as a part of education um in that task and i think that it's 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 you know there have been thinkers over the past few years who i think correct are correctly saying that we're basically at the end of bourgeois democracy so this fits in very well if you think about um, well, we're not the, not the, like right now we're not in the bourgeois democracy, but we're basically slowly moving out of a bourgeois democracy. And I think the lockdowns, for example, were, were, is a good example of a kind of crisis which signals that. And um, he's looking at the influence of media in this. So I'll keep um, in this process of this kind of failing bourgeois democratic state. Um, okay, so I'll keep going. If this period seems today to be irredeemably vanished, as in the period of classical bourgeois uh, education, um, it is not because people have, through decadence, become unwilling to follow their national literary curriculum. The epoch of nationalistic humanism has come to an end because the art of writing love-inspiring letters to a nation of friends, however professionally it is practiced, is no longer sufficient to form a telecommunicative bond between members of a mass of a modern mass society. Because the formation of a mass culture through the media, radio in the First World War, and television after the, sorry, television after 1945, uh, and even more so through the contemporary web revolution, the coexistence of people in the present societies has been established on new foundations. These are, as it can uncontrovertibly be shown, clearly post-literary. Post -literary. Um, and thus, post-humanistic. Anyone who thinks the, pre the prefix post in this formation is too dramatic can replace it with the adverb marginal. Thus, our thesis, modern societies can produce their political and cultural synthesis only marginally through literary, letter-writing, humanistic media. So, as, as I said, he's pointing out the, the changing media landscape and how this has disrupted the... Um, educational civilizing principle and sort of co in creating a kind of cohesive, uh, cohesive um, uh, social unity basically um, so there's a few different things going on here we have so we have we have a sense of unity we have a sense of, of civilizing um, and we have a we have a sense of the influence that media plays in this process of which has been heavily disrupted in the past 100 years and 50 years in particular, and probably 30 years even more particularly because of the internet. Um, so, so he says, the question of humanism is more than the bucolic, sorry, bucolic, I'm not even familiar with that word, what it means, assumption that reading improves us. So it's more than just the assumption that reading makes us better in some way. It's rather no less than an issue of anthropopodicy, that is, uh, a determination, characterization of man with respect to his biological and moral ambivalence. Okay. Above all, he says, however, from now, the question of how a person can become a true or real human being becomes unavoidably a media question. If we understand by media the means of, of, of a communion and communication by which human beings attain to that which they can and will become, end quote. So next he goes into Heidegger and Heidegger's um, letter on humanism in which Heidegger tries to more formally um, reject humanism. Quote, the word humanism must be abandoned if the real task of thinking has shown itself to, be, uh, to have been ex uh, exhausted in the humanistic or metaphysical traditions. It is to be furthered in its own original unity and irresist uh, irresistibility to... Uh, 
to put the point sharply, why should humanism and its general philosophical self-representation be seen as the solution for humanity when the catastrophe of the present clearly shows that it is man himself, along with his systems of metaphysical self-transcendence, improvement, and self-clarification, that is the problem. Um, but it is also seriously meant for the three contemporary remedies for the European maladies of 1945, Christianity, Marxism, and existentialism, which differed from one another only in their superficial characteristics, were characterized as parallel varieties of humanism, or more explicitly, as three ways um, and means of evading the last radicalization of the question about the essence of man. So, maybe we stop there and discuss that. He is much, you know, the... the the kind of barbarism of the 20th century in many ways has basically shown the, I think, I think this is what he's indicating too, has shown the um, clear ineffectiveness of kind of bourgeois literary cultures to actually provide cohesive and civilized human beings. We seem to be very prone to power struggles and genocides and wars and so on. So... Um, um, you know, there's been also just as a side note, there's been a lot written on the influence of propaganda in Nazi Germany. Um, there's also been a lot written about. There's also been a lot of discussion of media and, and how media works in the past few years in 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 in, in the West as well, with things like cancel culture and, um, you know, uh, false, uh, fake news, misinformation, and so on and so forth, right? So um, we're basically at a we're basically at a crisis where the humanistic tradition is failing to do what it was there to do to begin with. If today Heidegger's ontological shepherd's game, um, and by that he means humans as a more receptive. Um, 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 more receptive to being language being that the, the house of being and humans being capable of language um, as opposed to you know uh, we could say language as a as a kind of inform uh, informational tool that's what propaganda is right um, distinction and that's the distinction really um, we could say that Heidegger was also trying to draw out um, even though Heidegger never talked about propaganda explicitly, you know, it's, it's, it's implicit in, in the distinction of how he was thinking about language, how he was thinking about humans ontologically as receivers of being through language and not, not manipulators and users of language through, um, uh, through, you know, power struggles. Um, so if you take, basically, if you take that, um, idea of the kind of shepherd of being and so on, if we take it to be odd and jarring, Sloterdijk says, it nevertheless serves to have articulated in all its painfulness and leftist tendencies the question of, of the age. What can tame man when the role of humanism as the school for humanity has collapsed? What can tame men when their previous attempts at self-taming have led primarily to power struggles? What can tame men when, after all, previous experiments to grow the species up, it remains unclear what it is to be grown up? Or it is simply no longer possible to pose the question of the constraint and formation of mankind by theories of civilizing and upbringing. So that's the question posed and the relationship it has to language and to um, literacy cultures. So he's going to then go into, he's, he's going to move kind of more away now from um, literacy, writing, um, language, media. And he's going to talk more about this taming process, this taming, civilizing principle. Um, and of course, if we're going to go into this guy, into this area, we're going to have to talk about Nietzsche, which he does. Um, so he then goes in to say, we don't just place ourselves inside houses of linguistic being in Heidegger's sermons. We also place ourselves in literal houses as well. So we're going to talk about domestication. 
Um, he says theories about the history of domest uh, domesticity and changing relationship between men and um, and and animals has resulted in the phenomenon of pets. Um, quote Nietzsche, who read Darwin and Paul equally carefully, thought to see behind the horizon of scholarly man, taming um, scholarly man, taming a second darker horizon. He perceived the space in which the unavoidable battle over the direction of man breeding would begin, and this and and this is the space of the other, the veiled face of the clearing. As Zarathustra wandered through the city in which everyone had grown smaller. He saw the results of a so far profitable and uncontested breeding politics. People had succeeded in diminishing themselves through a collaboration of ethics and genetics. They have domesticated themselves and have committed themselves to a breeding program aimed at a pet-like accommodation. From this insight springs Zarathustra's specific criticism of humanism as a, as a denial of the false harmlessness with which the modern good man surrounds himself. Actually, it would not be um, a good thing if men breed themselves or other men for harmlessness. So with Nietzsche, we begin to see an awareness of the, of the uh, civilizing and taming process, um, of which we st we're beginning to include our environmental influences and conditioning um, into. Um, so Zarathustra's <laughs> observation this being um, that people were putting themselves, like willfully putting themselves in kind of domestic conditions which were making them smaller and more harmless. So um, with Nietzsche, we're starting to see a, uh, obviously a very poetic, but also a, 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 a heightened sense of awareness of, I would say, not only this process, but the new tools and the new mechanisms of which this process um, can take. And there's one part, I think it's in Twilight of the Idols, I can't remember the, the exact um, text, but it, he talks about a, he actually goes against Darwin and he says something like, Darwin thought that it was all about improvement, that evolution was all about improvement. And he says that actually, um, improvement can be a menagerie and menagerie is a place also speaking of animals where animals are tamed and beaten for like circus events and so on. Um, so with Nietzsche, we see a very, a, a much more heightened sense of this house of being, we could call it being a rather, um, harmful process, um, which kind of denigrates man and so on. Um, so quote, this is the root of the basic conflict Nietzsche postulates for the future. The battle between those who wish to breed for minimization and those who wish to breed for maximization of human function. Or as we might say, a battle between humanists and superhumanists. The image of the Superman that is emblematic of Nietzsche's thought is not that of a release of repressions or a swerve into bestialization, excuse me, as was imagined by the um, Nazis, basically. Nor does it stand for a regression of humanity back to what he was before the current status of house and church pet. When Nietzsche speaks of the Ubermensch, he's imagining an, an era of the world far in the future. Fascist readers of Nietzsche stubbornly misrepresented and pretending that his distinction referred to them and the present day, describing the difference between themselves and ordinary men. He takes into account... Um, Sorry, he takes into consideration the previous millennia, long processes, the application of intimate constraints of breeding, taming, and raising, through which, until now, human beings have, have been produced, a production, admittedly, that knew how to make itself virtually invisible, and that succeeded in the project of domestication under the disguise of schooling. Um, so... Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's concern here is with the uh, minimization, we can say, remember, um, his, his, in, in Zarathustra, we have this um, image of humans domesticating themselves, putting them in, in houses, which are making them smaller. So there's a, there's a sort of, there's a sort of polarity here, which Nietzsche is observing between the kind of minimizing projects of human production 
and the maximizing projects of human production. And you could, just to get to biogenetics, as we're going to get to soon, you could put that in either camp. You know, uh, one could, one could, it's very, um, biogen biogenetics are very ambivalent. We, we could, on one hand, perceive of biogenetics being something which is going to make superhumans. And on the other hand, you could conceive of it something which is going to make things, people very predictable and controllable, or maybe even stupid or um, thoughtless and so on. Um, it's a tool and tools can be used either way. So this is, this is kind of Nietzsche's um, intuition on, on, on the ambivalence, we could say, of this um, civilizing process. The discourse, he says, about difference and the control of taming and breeding, indeed, just a suggestion about the decline of awareness of how human beings are produced and indeed the anthropo technology, as I, as I explained earlier, anthropo technology is the uh, mechanisms in which this human cultivation is um, used, basically. And it doesn't necessarily have to be technical. Not, this, is not, this isn't something, it doesn't have to be biological. It can be through practice, habit. It can be through through moral um, understandings. It can be through a sort of self-awareness. It could be through um, educational mechanisms and so on and so forth. Um, these are prospects from which we may not, in the present day, avert our eyes, lest they once again begin to be presented as harmless. Nietzsche probably went too far when he suggested that the defanging of men was the premeditated project of a group of pastoral breeders. That is, a project of clerical or Pauline insight that foresaw everything that might that men might be capable of if they were, were free and left to themselves. And so in, um, instituted comp compensatory and preventative measures against it. That would certainly be a hybrid and unlikely conclusion because for one thing he imagined the potential breeding project being carried out in much too short of a period as if only a few generations of priestcraft were required to turn wolves into dogs and ordinary men into professors at basel um it is implausible as well because the, it presupposes a conscious agent we're actually a breeding without a breeder, an agentless biopolitical drift is more likely still, even after we bracket the exaggeration and fierce anti-clericalism, there remains um, of Nietzsche's idea a solid kernel sufficient to encourage reflection on, on the humanistic harmlessness of humanity. So he's basically saying that Nietzsche went to, may, might, may have went too far, and you see this with the kind of conspir the conspiracy theory element too, obviously Nazism, and there is, a, there is if you read Nietzsche, there is a sort of conspiratorial um, component to him. Um, it's not, like, it's very specific, but he has a conspiracy, you know, the weak conspire against the strong to inhibit them and to hold them back from becoming what, if they were free to be, would be much greater. And this is the kind of psychological uh, motivation of Rosantamont and so on. Now, that's a kind of more conspirator conspiratorial reading, and I think slaughter -like is saying that what's more likely is a more like a kind of relatively agentless and unconscious um, kind of, um, what does he call it? He calls it a um, biocultural drift. So this taming process was not necessarily a, consp a kind of vindictive conspiracy against free high-spirited strong people or something but it was a part of a of a humanistic tendency to civilize men um which was justified but perhaps c considered itself entirely harmless which was a which was a um mistake basically the, 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 these processes aren't without risks they're not totally harmless and that's the insight we can take from Nietzsche even if he even if he exaggerated things in a certain way that 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 process is not risk-free it's not harmless and that's what Nietzsche was right about so <laughs> this Nietzschean intuition of the potentially harmful nature of um, civilizing taming breeding and so on um, is I suppose brought back into our awareness through biotechnology um the, his his reference to 
the kind of domesticating conditions, the, the, the sorts of houses which, which um, these people in Zarathustra were putting themselves in, making them smaller and so on, um, it couldn't be, they, they, these houses, we could say, you know, so we have the linguistic house of being, we have the physical house of being, and then we could quite easily then have the kind of genetic house of being. Um, the genetic, um, the, the house can be used as a kind of interchangeable metaphor for the ways in which humans are bred, cultivated, um and uh you know made and i think that the the house is a good metaphor because it's not necessarily something we're totally conscious of it's not like something that is that's necessarily like a a tool in the sense of like you know i don't know like this microphone it kind of has a very practical and obvious use a house is a kind of a kind of collection of different instruments and tools which um is kind of constantly influencing us and constantly we're constantly in a kind of state of, of, of adaptation to and of course we can influence the house we can build things differently we can put things up differently and so on but there's this constant um reciprocal um relationship of design we could say nearly which we're in, being engaged with when we're talking of these uh, houses whether they're linguistic whether they're physical or whether they're scientific and to do with genetics and so on so the last section is a discussion on plato and plato's text the statesman has a lot of we could say zoological references in it there's a lot of discussions of well what are humans um they're bipedal they don't use the word bipedal back then but they're they're two-legged and they don't have wings and these things have wings and um uh these animals run on four legs and so on the actually if you look at protagoras the dialogue protagoras gives in his in his telling of the promethean myth goes into this as well about um the the difference of animals like humans were left without fur without claws um some animals have claws some animals are very large some animals are very small some can go very fast they, they, they all have their kind of means of self-preservation and then a human being has fire as his means of um, self-preservation so in a slightly different context there's a there's an inclination in plato um about these myths and how there's a kind of need to distinguish man from the other animals and what it is that distinguishes man from the other animals and then we start talking about the essence of man what is man on the on the ontology of man what is man um so um just to quote him, he says, the domestication of man is the great un unthinkable from which humanism from antiquity to the present has averted its eyes. Recognizing this suffices to plunge us into deep waters. And in those deep waters, we are flooded with the realization that at no um, time was it or will it be possible to accomplish the taming and befriending of men with letters alone. Uh, certainly, reading was a great power for the upbringing and improvement of men. It, it still is today, to some extent. But nonetheless, breeding, whatever form it may have taken, was always present at the as the power behind the mirror. Reading and breeding are have more to do with each other than cultural historians are able or willing to admit. Even if the, it is impossible to adduce evidence for this suspicion or to pin it down, pin, sorry, to, to pin down the relationship between the two, breeding and reading. The connection is nonetheless more than a random suggestion. The true, the real basis for the art, uh, sorry, this is, um, I'll, exp I'll explain this first. Um, so yeah, so, so we're going to go into this kind of um, um, more political dimension now of Plato in the Statesman. The Statesman is a sort of leader or a sort of king. Um, and Slaughter like is going to think of him as being someone who takes responsibility for this breeding process and thinks about what it means, and that would I presume that would uh, that would mean improving, but also realizing the sacrifices, the risks, the potential harmfulness of improvement. 
So, his, so, so the problem with, the, with, with, with humanism is essentially that it only sees one way and that's up. It only sees one way and that's forward. All improvement is good. All um, civilizing is better. And it doesn't see the hidden side beneath it. It doesn't see the ambivalence, which is that there can be, and, uh, and perhaps unconsciously, it doesn't have to be conspiratorial, there can be a, um, a negative breeding, we could say, which can occur um, in these attempts to civilize and pros and 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 tame and so on and improve and the, the, there can be an a bit uh, an ambivalence to this improving and now that may just be a fact of civilized life but when you add on top of it biogenetics suddenly it becomes kind of unignorable suddenly you have to start thinking about that other side you can't keep only thinking improvement is 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 by proxy better that there's another side so um, Plato actually in his, in his statesman offers a sort of like, um, interesting example. I think Slaughter like is going to play around with, of someone who kind of takes responsibility for this breeding shepherding process. Um, so this is a quote from Slaughter like about Plato and the statesman. The, the true, the real basis for the art of the king lies not in the vote of the public, which gives or withholds trust from their rulers as it will nor does it lie in in inherited privilege or recent accumulation of power the platonic master finds the reason for his mastery only in the expertise and by this he doesn't mean the technocratic expertise by the way i like this is a translation as well so um he doesn't mean he doesn't mean like technical expertise in this stupid sense that we think of it um but anyway the Platonic master finds the reason for his mastery only in the expertise he has in the in the odd and peculiar art of breeding. Here, excuse me. Here we see the reemergence of the expert king, whose justification is the insight about how, without doing damage to their free will, human beings can best sort themselves out and make connections. Royal anthropotechnology, in short demands of the statesman that he understands how to bring together free but suggestible people in order to bring out the characteristics that are most advantageous to the whole so that under his direction the human zoo can achieve the optimum homeostasis this comes about when the two relative optima of human character warlike courage and philosophical humanistic contemplation are woven together in tapestry of the species but because in their extremes both virtues can lead to distortions the one militaristic warmongering with its bad consequences the other quietism and privatization which can stupefy the land that it falls so that it falls into servitude without ever even noticing it the statesman has to exclude the inappropriate natures before he begins to weave the chosen ones into the fabric of the state and quote so if you think about plato in the sense of um of if you think about uh, the harmonization of the soul harmonization of different aspects of society the spirited the uh the logos the rational and the desiring eros um there's a sense of the, the balancing and harmonization which Plato is clearly about metaphysically, but this also applies to anthropotechnology, which is the sense of how do we, how do we create people? How do we educate? How do we civilize people? Um, and I think this is something which is, which is often left out when people talk about Plato, is that he does have a strong component, and I've done some work on Thymos, which is the spirit side of the soul, so um, I'll leave the link in the description to the, the videos I've done on that. But... Um, there's a sense of uh, a sort of uh, a sort of right balancing and right harmony between this kind of militant courage warlike character and the contemplative um, reflective philosophical type character of which um, there's an important balance between the two of which I think he's suggesting that this proper humanization the proper creating of full humans is um is 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 done probably more correctly than ever when these things when these two things are done 
together well. Um, which was probably, what, and, and, and the ideal leader for Plato is someone who can shepherd and look over this, who can look over this, um, this proper balancing um, with the right direction in hand, but is also aware of the potential dangers and harmfulness that it could cause. So just to keep reading, um, Plato had God to guide this task. So this is another point that Slotterdijk wants to make, that for Plato, this task of man breeding, we can call it in kind of simple terms, is something which was connected, of course, through recollection, recollection being a memory of which the wise have to to a certain um, I, ideal end, te a teleological end of which is genuinely um, a, a, a sort of improvement. It's not an improvement based just off like whatever is, is of our interests at any given year. It's an improvement which is sort of grounded in something which is a recollection of perfection of some form, um, which is very different to what we have today. We don't really have these sort of metaphysical and teleological conceptions and of, of a direction and a perfection and an ideal which we can, which we can move towards. Um, so, so we're not in the same position as Plato. I don't think he's trying to say, but Plato's conception of the task of a leader, I think, in overseeing this is still helpful and useful for us today. Um, so two, he says, 2,000 years after Plato wrote it, it seems as if not only the gods, but the wise have abandoned us and left us alone with our partial, and what by wise he means those with the, rec with the right recollection who can see over this uh, man, <laughs> the good kind of man breeding and not the bad kind. Um, so 2,000 years after Plato wrote it, it seems as if not only the gods, but the wise have, let, have abandoned us and left us alone with our partial knowledge and our ignorance. What is left to us in the place of the wise is their writings in their glinting brilliance and their increasing obscurity. They still lay in more or less accessible editions. They can still be read. If only we knew why one should bother. It's their fate to stand in silent bookshelves like posted letters no longer collected, sent to us by authors of whom we no longer know whether or not they could be our friends, end quote. And that's how he ends the essay, uh, which is a brilliant way to end the essay. Um, of, um, I think what he's asking us to do is, in light of biogenetics, think about this improving civilizing principle um, think about it as um, something which can actually it gives us a sense of responsibility and a sense of um, um, a, a, a sort of task of which is not exclusive to us. Plato was aware of it, but that because of these technologies, we have an extremely heightened sense of responsibility to properly understand what this improvement is, what this... Um, 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 uh, man breeding civilizing principle is and the potential harmfulness of it and as he says you know the death of god we are without god but we are also without the wise we are also without anyone who can oversee this properly which then infers a political question um yeah so that's basically it it's a great essay i'd recommend it it's i'm kind of uh, trying to collect texts which are the most relevant towards biotechnology and are going to prepare us for thinking about biotechnology properly because I don't think biotechnology is really something that is, is at this very present moment pressing, but I think in the next few years, God knows how soon it's going to be extremely pressing. So I think it's good to collect these texts um, and uh, which are going to properly inform us so that we can address the issue adequately without basically just being blindsided by it when it comes about. Um, and this is, I think, of one of the most foundational texts of that genre, if we could call it a genre. Um, so yeah, so I'm hoping to do more on these sorts of texts as, as, I, as I discover them and as time goes by. So if anyone has any suggestions for texts, leave them in the comments. Um, also remember to, uh, if you haven't subscribed, subscribe. I have links in the description to Substack, 
um, Patreon and Twitter so you can follow on whatever you want. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you. See you later.